This is Chapter 3, Leadership. So let's first define the difference between a manager and a leader. So managers are individuals in an organization who can effectively manage finances and production and purchasing, but they may or may not be effective leaders. So you can have a manager who's a great leader. So these could be synonymous, one and the same. I mean, you can have a manager who's not an effective leader, but can, you know, get the tasks done that are required of them. So what is a leader? So leaders are good managers who are people oriented and demonstrate respect, concern and empathy for others in a work setting. So as I mentioned in, in chapter two, you know, sometimes you have managers who are great people, people, right? They're, they're really good at communicating. They're really good at um, understanding and being empathetic. Um, and those are usually or typically aspects of good leadership. Um, not That's not all encompassing for leaders, it's just an example. Um, and sometimes managers are lacking that, that people skill. And so thus, maybe they aren't the best of leaders. So we do have formal and informal leaders. Um, formal leaders are those that really that hold that title and that, that position. So they're usually also the manager or your CEO or your director level um, titles. Informal leaders are those individuals who really demonstrate a lot of leadership characteristics, but they don't hold that title. Um, they may be a coworker of yours, um, but you know, you oftentimes may go to them for their advice or their leadership, or they're the ones that um, are you can always count on to get you through maybe a rush of, of customers um, because they show true leadership grace under pressure. Um, and they, but they don't typically hold that formal um, title as a manager. So we're gonna talk about some six major traits that leaders have, um, and we'll go through each of these in subsequent slides. So the first is intelligence. Um, usually this includes the ability to acquire and retain knowledge and respond quickly uh, and successfully to any kind of situation that they've been thrown. Um, but this isn't always correlated with educational level. So a lot of times people think, um, you know, somebody with a PhD is highly intelligent. Well, yeah, they probably are. Um, but it's not always book smart. Intelligence doesn't always mean book smart. Um, a lot of times this is emotional intelligence and being able to read a room, so to speak, and being able to read body language and um, understanding how people um, react in certain situations. And this intelligence characteristic, it must complement, be complemented with other types of leadership traits like drive. Drive is definitely a leadership trait um, related to ambition and effort and the ability to take risks when necessary when they, they um, find a, ways to succeed. Uh, a willingness to take on difficult tasks and implement new ideas. This is a very common leadership skill. People hate change. I don't care who you are. Um, most people do not like changing way things are done, especially if they say, you know, it's always worked this way. Why are we changing things now? Um, usually a leader will find and maybe a way things have done, been done, but they're willing to take on um, a new way of doing something and, and setting the the path for other um, employees to do so. And they have they usually set themselves pretty high standards and others. They, they're not willing to ask others to do what they're not willing to do. Um, and they, they have high standards for, for everybody that they oversee. And they're typically motivating and they have a lot of motivation. Um, they have a, a need to share the vision with others and eventual goal of the organization and they use the power for good of the group. So we're going to talk about power in just a few slides here towards the end of this lecture and there's lots of different types of power um, that management has and they use their power for the good of the group and for success and for um, you know in increasing the overall morale also of the the employees and they have a desire to be a leader they're usually there the always one that 
people count on and they enjoy that, that aspect. Leaders usually have integrity, um, their reliability, their fair, their credibility. Um, you, you can trust them, they're honest, or you can count on them to be honest, and they act with impartiality. So they don't favor one individual over another just because maybe they're friends. They, they can come in as an impartial um, judge of, of the situation. Typically, leaders have some self-confidence, too. Um, confidence and security in themselves to make decisions, take risks, and admit to making mistakes. Boy, this is a big one. Um, having someone in a, in a management position admitting, oh, we screwed up, um, and they're, they're willing to take the blame and the, the ownership of it. That shows true self-confidence and leadership. Um, they can compose, keep their composure in the face of negative criticism, and they don't crumble or point fingers. Um, and as mentioned before, they, they definitely have grace under pressure. So when the going gets tough, they don't lose their minds and, and have outbursts. They keep themselves um, composed and get things done. Typically, in leadership positions, there's expertise. They have knowledge of the field that they are working in and what they are, who they're leading. Um, lower level management, more technical expertise is typically required, right? Because you're those managers are the ones teaching those new staff or staff members how to do tasks, whether that's to use the pizza oven, whether that's to use the tilt skillet, or how to create a certain menu item. They need that expertise and to be able to show um, how a, a, a new member how to do that. Upper management levels, they usually need to know where um, their department or their organization falls and how things, how decisions will affect the, the greater good. Um, if you were to implement this particular policy, how is it going to roll downhill and affect everybody um, along the way? And is that going to be a good effect or a negative effect? And what kind of repercussions may be in place because of that? So that's a that's definitely a skill um, that leaders have. Okay, so there's lots of different styles of leadership that we're going to go through. Um, Acratic, autocratic, participative, democratic, consensus. Um, leaders usually have one of these styles predominantly, but they can move to different types depending on the situation. Um, it just really depends on the, the individual. So let's talk about autocratic. This is a style where the leader takes total control. They assume full authority and they take responsibility for the area. Um, they make all the decisions with very little input from other individuals. Um, this is oftentimes equated to the military model. Do as I say, just don't ask questions. Um, takes very little time, obviously, to reach a decision, so that's an advantage here, but there's not a lot of input from others. So leaders in this type of style may find that they lack um, employee buy-in. And if you're going to make a change to your environment and your organization, specific, I mean, really, if it's going to be a large change, you need employee buy-in to make it happen. And so in this type of style, you're lacking that. And so it may be difficult to implement anything new within your organization. Um, the next one is participative leadership. This style, um, the leader gathers information and seeks input from colleagues and um, subordinates before taking action, which is a, 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 a night. This is can be effective. Um, some advantages. Leaders have a variety of different ideas at their disposal, so they have a lot of input. Um, and others feel like they are contributing, that they have a, a meaningful role in the process. And, you know, that's what a lot of people want. They want to be able to have their, their say, especially if they have an idea that can be, they think could be really useful and effective. Um, the disadvantage to this, as you can probably imagine, imagine it takes a long time to get the, anything done. Um, a lot of time and energy because you're getting a lot of input. And as you are probably aware, not everybody's input is going to be the same. So you have a lot of opinions you have to weigh. Um, and this can cause hurt feelings if something's implemented that didn't go or wasn't suggested by a certain group or individual. So 
you kind of have to be careful when using this type of leadership style. It will really depend on the decision that needs to be made. Democratic leadership is another style, and this is based on majority rules, um, and decisions are made by a group. So examples of types of decisions that are successful with this type of leadership are policies and procedures, maybe hiring a new staff member, um, developing marketing and strategic plans. So you might have a group that helps decide these types of outcomes like hiring a new staff is fairly common to have a group interview or a panel interview right where you have multiple people interviewing an individual for a position and then as a group you decide who it is that you will hire for that role um, advantages it increases the possibility of making good decisions because you have lots of heads in the game and responsibility is shared um, disadvantages like the one previous this can be very time-consuming again because you have a lot of opinions lots of um, you know ideas involved and so trying to then come to a final decision can be time-consuming last one is consensus leadership and this is which decisions or plans are made by a group in which each member is in agreement so everybody has to agree on the outcome um, so search committees like a jury is probably your best example here um, so group support for the action taken so everybody agrees on how you're going to proceed and as you can imagine with all the rest of these, this is exceptionally large time commitment because not only do you have to get everybody's opinion, but you have to get everybody to agree on the final outcome. So um, that's why a lot of times juries aren't successful, right? Because they have one or two members who aren't in agreement with the decision that's made and thus they become a hung jury. So it, it can be very effective, but it can also be unsuccessful just depending on um, the situation. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, differences between transformational and transforming leadership. So transformational really is a style that transforms employees who merely carry out duties um, to employees who feel comfortable in contributing their input to management processes. So they can, you know, provide their feedback, um, and but they're the ones who are boots on the ground. They're actually going to be the one um, conducting or carrying out the decision but they they definitely feel comfortable in contributing their input to management and so you want that as a leader you want your your um, employees to feel comfortable with contributing their input um, and then transforming leadership is a style that really prepares your subordinates to take over management you're grooming them to be a successor or to come up in the ranks and if really and and, and I had a I had a, a a leader or a, a supervisor in the past who told me, you know, if I'm a supervisor worth my salt, I can determine who would be a good manager and it's my role to groom them and to put them in, give them opportunities to get experience so they can eventually take that role in management um, and not suppress that, not feel like I'm being challenged or they're going to take my job, but rather groom leaders um, to be, whether or not they work for me or not, or they work in this organization or not, my role is really to, to find that passion and that interest in leadership and management and make it happen because we always need good managers, right? All right, let's talk a little bit about power. Um, as mentioned before, leadership has power. There's different types of power um, and how you use that. Um, so they're all listed here, but we're going to go through each one in the next slides. So let's talk about expert power. This is the power that comes from having knowledge, experience, and information in a field. Um, it allows that leader to exert influence because of having that awareness and that knowledge. And this type of power only typically comes with experience and time. Um, yes, there's some book knowledge here too. Um, a, a, you know, a degree ha helps with this, having that baseline knowledge and understanding. But you'll find over the years that leadership with this type of power, typically when they're speaking, it comes from experience of using that knowledge within the field. 
Referent power is that which stems from the relationship between the leader and their followers. It's not necessarily based on their title right, or their position, but it's on that leader's ability to share a vision. They're very influential, might be a very good speaker, um, and can share a passion and a, and a vision for what it is that they're doing. Um, you know, a, a lot of times people are drawn to these individuals because of just their speaking uh, abilities and their ability to, to convey their passion for a, spe a specific subject matter. Legitimate power, this really comes from the title that they hold. So um, this is the factor that really separates formal and informal leaders, right? What we talked about earlier in these slides. So you can uh, have a title and, and that gives you that legitimate power in that role. Reward power comes from the leader's ability to reward employees. Um, and depending on the organization, this may vary in what they have the ability to provide their employees. This could be money, could be gifts. Um, a lot of times it's recognition and praise because those are easier to provide um, very quickly um, and they don't cost the organization anything to do. And yet it still is um, rewarding and acknowledging an employee for their hard work. And honestly, sometimes that's, sometimes that's all an employee needs at that moment is not 50 bucks. I mean, don't get me wrong, that helps, right? But recognition for a job well done. Like if you just had a big push of customers and you and your team got through it flawlessly, recognizing that um, that ability to do that and recognizing their their hard work and and um, dedication, it, it's very empowering to an employee and and rewarding. And it it keeps up morale. Let's be real. I mean, everybody likes recognition and praise, and so sometimes that's really what a um, a leader should fall on more often than not. But Money and gifts, of course, too, when when available and needed. Okay, so let's look at the other coercive power. So this is more of the negative side. Power to punish, which just sounds so harsh, um, may include things like difficult work schedules or increased workloads, um, assignments of undesirable tasks or discipline, suspension or termination. Um, sometimes individuals use this power more, unfortunately, um, you know, and, and not necessarily with the discipline suspension, but they do things to force employees out, um, like a difficult work schedule, making it impossible for an employee to be effective in their job. Um, sometimes increased workloads are given, but it doesn't mean to be a punishment. Sometimes that's just the nature of the organization at the time. I know I've been in roles where I've been given more to do, but I it wasn't provided or wasn't given to me as a punishment. It was just, this is temporary. Um, maybe we have a, a lack of employees at the time, or we don't have enough anybody to take on this to give it to you temporarily. Um, so, I mean, increased workloads could be seen as a punishment, but sometimes it's not meant as that um, or intended to be as such.